Hi class, <clears throat> welcome to chapter four, food and religion. So what are the most prevalent religions? Worldwide Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, focusing on the West parts. Those are the most prevalent in the West. In the Eastern world, Hindu and Buddhism are most prevalent. In the United States, Protestant, Catholic, and then no religion. Um, people who don't associate with the religion are the top three in the United States. Many religions have dietary practices, such as foods that are allowed, foods that are restricted, feasting and fasting days. However, within each religion, it's possible that people who follow that religion may have stricter or less strict adherence to those recommendations. For example, this is a picture of a sturgeon fish pictured here, and sturgeon fish are born without scales and then develop scales later in life. According to Jewish dietary law, fish that don't have scales are considered banned and uh, forbidden food. Um, However, since the sturgeon develops its scales later, it's kind of questionable. And so Jews who are orthodox, meaning very strict in their followings of Jewish dietary law, don't eat sturgeon, but Jews who are less strict do eat sturgeon. <clears throat> Judaism. So first we're going to talk about Judaism and Jewish people. Um, there was a history of diaspora of the Jews, and what diaspora means is a disbursement of Jews outside their homeland of Israel. The cornerstone of Jewish religion is the Hebrew Bible, and the first five books are called the Torah or the Book of Moses. And it's within the Torah that the dietary laws are set, and we're going to learn about that coming up. There are three kind of categories of Jews. There are Orthodox Jews, Reform Jews, and Conservative Jews. Orthodox Jews are kind of the most strict and adherent to their religion, and they believe all Jewish laws as the direct commandments of God should be followed. Reform Jews do not believe that the rituals are permanently binding, um, and they believe some of the laws are still being interpreted, so they are kind of more lenient with their following of Jewish laws, and then conservative Jews are somewhere in between the Orthodox Jews and the Reformed Jews. Peak Jewish immigration to the U.S. occurred in the 1800s, 1900s. Um, there are currently 6.34 million as of the latest census data, 2014. And then there's a lot of stereotypes regarding Jewish foods and even Jewish culture. Um, and, and my father was Jewish. I come from um, paternal lines of Jewish ancestry, Ashkenazi Jews, so I can speak about this topic from personal experience, and I'm not trying to be stereotypical at all, um, but sometimes people think of, you know, maybe matzah or bagels or lox or dill pickles, um, things like that when they think of Jewish foods. And those are things that were commonly eaten in my family. Cash rut is the name for the Jewish dietary laws. And so this is something important to remember. And we're going to talk about what, what is involved in the Jewish dietary laws on this slide. So the Jewish dietary laws, like I said, are followed by Orthodox Jews and some conservative Jews. And you may have heard of the word kosher before. Kosher, remember, is not the name for the Jewish dietary laws. That was actually kashrut. But kosher means fit. And glat kosher is the strictest kosher standards that are used um, in obtaining and preparing the food. So glat kosher is even stricter than just regular kosher, um, if, if that's even impossible. The main reason for Jews observing their Jewish dietary laws are for spiritual reasons, and it's believed that Jews who follow, follow the Jewish dietary laws are expressing their obligation to God. A kind of fun fact is since 2003, the sale of kosher foods has increased dramatically, and this is because people perceive them as being healthier, safer, and more pure, whether or not they're actually Jewish. And so now we're going to talk about some of these different components, these eight different components of the Jewish dietary law. 
All right, so which, which animals can you eat and which animals can you not eat? Definitely want you to be familiar with this. There are animals that are classified as clean versus unclean, and they are listed here. Pigs, pork, carnivorous animals, rabbits are considered unclean. Birds must have a talon, a crop, and a gizzard to be considered clean. Birds of prey are not considered clean, so no eagles or falcons um, or hawks or things like that. And then clean fish versus unclean fish. So a clean fish has to have fins and scales. So clean fish is going to look something like this. I'm a beautiful artist, and it's got scales. These are its scales. Um, etc. Unclean fish does not have fins or scales and includes rays, so ray would be unclean, um, sharks, shellfish, and then reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates, which are animals without a backbone, are also considered unclean. How do you prepare animals for slaughter so that they can be cooked and eaten? Um, the life of the animal has to be taken care of, and uh, an animal can only be sacrificed by somebody called a shohet, who is a Jew who's been licensed and trained to perform the slaughter. And they do the slaughter in a very quick and painless method, which to me doesn't sound quick and painless, but they cut through the jugular and the trachea at the same time so that the animal um, loses blood supply as well as airway. Examining the slaughtered animal. So animals can't just be slaughtered and then eaten. They have to be examined for blemishes in the meat. They also have to be examined for organs that render it trefa. And what trefa means is unfit for consumption. So you would not eat something that is trefa. There are additional parts of the animals that are not permitted to eat. You cannot eat the blood. You can't eat the fat that surrounds the organs. You can't eat any diseased part of the animal either. So if any part of the animal is diseased, you cannot eat that. You also cannot eat the sciatic nerve. Um, and we talked about the haleb a little bit, but this is the fat. So there is a process to prepare meat for consumption under Jewish dietary law. And first the meat is soaked in water. It is then drained on a slanted perforated board. This guy is using, um, <laughs> it looks like a milk crate, so that I'm not sure exactly how kosher that is, but it's a perforated surface, so it's probably okay. Meat is then covered in kosher salt for at least an hour. The salt is rinsed off, and then the meat is rinsed repeatedly. And this process is considered um, or called koshering of the meat. For some Jews who are um, trying to eat Jewish under Jewish dietary law, they may need to watch their meat consumption because it is coated in salt and salt can contribute to high blood pressure. So Jews who have issues with high blood pressure are encouraged to limit their meat consumption, even of kosher meat. There are laws governing meat and milk consumption and milk and meat cannot be eaten together at the same time. In addition to that, um, kind of illustrated by this picture here, you cannot use the same utensils or cutting board to cut or prepare milk and meat. So here's your cutting board for meat, here is your cutting board for uh, dairy products and different utensils are used. So you would not be able to eat like a cheese and salami sandwich or a meat and salami sandwich at the same meal. Even though many Jews are lactose intolerant, about 60 to 80 percent, they still do incorporate sour cream, yogurt, and cheese. Um, and cream cheese is very common in Jewish culture as well. Um, so those are still popular items. As far as the eating of milk and meat. If you have eaten meat, you have to wait six hours before you can have dairy. If you have eaten dairy, you only have to eat one, wait one hour before you can consume meat. Products from forbidden animals. So insects are forbidden and bees are an insect, but honey is actually allowed. And the reason that honey is allowed is because um, kosher honey, which you can actually see this is kosher honey right here, does not have any parts of the insect in it. So this would be okay. 
We do examine foods for insects and worms because like I just mentioned, you cannot eat insects. Um, and then once the food has been examined, gone through the koshering process, um, examined by a rabbi, it does have the insignia to indicate it's kosher. And the insignia is some sort of the form of K. Um, and depending on where the food comes from, the symbol might be slightly different. The K signal symbol means um, that the rabbi has inspected it, and this is actually an FDA approved signal symbol. Jewish holidays. So the Sabbath occurs from Friday night until Saturday night, and this is a day of rest. Strict Orthodox Jews um, don't use any electricity during this time. They don't use any, they don't do any work. They don't prepare any meals. They don't heat up any meals. So cold food is eaten that was prepared ahead of time. They don't use the stove or anything like that. Rosh Hashanah is Jewish New Year. They'll usually bake a challah bread, even though there's a C here, the C is silent, so it's a challah bread. Um, and this is pictured in the corner of the slide. This round shape is used to symbolize a year that is uninterrupted by issues with health um, or issue, any sort of issue. So a year that has uninterrupted happiness and health. Some families might eat the head of a fish or a sheep, and this was supposedly God's wish for them. And then some families may eat pomegranate. Pomegranates are supposed to contain 613 seeds, which I, I have not counted to confirm, but those 613 seeds are meant to represent the commandments of the Torah because there are 613 um, commandments in the Torah. Yom Kippur is a day of fasting and people will fast from sunset to sunset and Yom Kippur is uh, the holiest day of the year. So excuse my writing, but this is the holiest day of the year. Holiest. And it's a day of fasting. So Kut is Jewish Thanksgiving and it tends to last um, about a week. And then there's also the Feast of the Tabernacle. Hanukkah. Many people probably have heard of Hanukkah. Um, Hanukkah is an eight-day celebration. It's called the Festival of Lights. It actually occurs at a different time each year. And during Hanukkah, people enjoy foods that are cooked in oils, such as donuts or potato pancakes. I used to eat potato pancakes as a child growing up, um, and traditionally they're called latkes, and they're, they're very delicious. Kareem is a feasting holiday, and they will eat hamantash, hamans pockets or ears, which are pictured here. And these are small triangle-shaped pastries um, with little fruits in them, and they have poppy seed or jam. They'll also eat the challah bread and fish. Passover is a celebration of the Jewish anniversary from Egypt, and there is a Passover Seder that occurs, which we will talk about. Um, some common foods include matzo ball soup, chicken, matzo crackers, and they don't eat any leavened foods. Um, they don't eat leavened bread because the story is when the Jews were fleeing Egypt, there was no time for their bread to rise, so they ate this unleavened bread, and it's very flat and dry, and it's called Called matzah. Passover. So this is a link to a Passover video that I would encourage you to watch. It's not very long and explains all of the items on the Seder plate, which you should definitely be familiar with. Um, you don't have to know these Jewish or Hebrew words for them. You can use common American words. Um, but the Zorah is a roasted shank bone, and it's symbolic of the ancient lamb in Egypt. The Beit Zah is a roasted egg representing the required offering, and it's used as a symbol of mourning for the loss of the temple in Jerusalem. The marrow are bitter herbs that are symbolic of suffering of the Jews. The haroset represents um, the mortar used by the Jews to build the pyramids in Egypt, and it includes apple, nuts, cinnamon, and wine. And then the karpas are green vegetables, such as lettuce or parsley, and that's meant to represent the meager diet of the Jews, and they're often dipped in salt water um, to represent the tears of the Jews. And then the special cup is set on the table for the prophet Elijah, who was a messenger of God. So do be familiar with these. 
Jewish fast days. There are many days in Jewish religion where they fast, meaning they don't eat or they don't eat for a certain period of time. Yom Kippur, we discussed already. Tisha B'Av represents the destruction of the first and second temples of Jerusalem. And during these times, they don't have any food from sunset to sunset. Um, other fast days, the Eve of Purim, the Eve of Passover, and the day after Rosh Hashanah. Many Jews fast on Yom Kippur, but mainly Orthodox Jews uh, observe the other fast days. And I, I meant to say this disclaimer at the beginning of this class, but please excuse my pronunciation. I do the best that I can, but with all these different religions and cultures, I'm completely sure that it's not 100% accurate, but I do do the best that I can. All right, so moving away from Jews, we are going to talk about Christians. Um, so there are more people who are Christian than any other religion. Um, and specifically in the US, this is the most prevalent religion. There are three main branches of Christianity. There is Roman Catholicism, um, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and Protestantism. Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is a branch of Christianity um, that is headed by the Pope, and they have seven different sacraments. They have 66 million people following them as of 2014 and are the largest groups of Christians who are primarily made up of immigrants. They have many feasting days and fasting days. Um, their big feast days are Christmas, Easter, New Year's Day, Palm Sunday, etc. And they do have fasting days. However, these are not strict fasts. Um, many of them include food, but at a specific time. So for example, maybe a midday meal would be allowed or maybe only certain foods are restricted. So they're not strict fasts as in some of the other religious groups we're going to talk about. Things that they eat, they are well known for their use of unleavened bread for communion and also their celibacy of the clergy and the position of the Pope. This kind of differentiates Eastern Orthodox Christianity from Roman Catholics. Um, there are 3 million Americans who follow Eastern Christian or, or Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and they have feast days, Easter as their main holiday. So you saw Christmas and Easter previously for this group. It is just Easter. They eat red Easter eggs. Um, the red eggs are supposed to represent the tomb of Christ, and the red color is meant to represent the mourning um, of Christ's death. And then when the egg is broken, it represents the release of his spirit. Fast days include days during Lent, and similar to the other culture that I just discussed, Roman Catholicism, during fast days, they may be allowed to eat some foods, but other foods are restricted, but they're not strict fasts. Protestantism, so the third kind of subcategory of Christianity. And Protestantism believes that individuals could communicate with God without the uh, kind of presence of a priest or a saint, and each person was their own minister. There are many different branches of Protestantism, and within the branches of Protestantism, specifically the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventists have kind of the most specific dietary laws. So Mormons. Mormons um, are people who follow the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they were founded by Joseph Smith. The Book of Mormon was published in 1829. They believe that God reveals himself and his will through his apostles and prophets. There are lots of churches in Utah as well as Missouri, and Utah used to be about 80% Mormon, but more recent numbers show that the percentages of Mormons are declining compared to others. They have 5 million members and many dietary laws. So they do not smoke or use tobacco. They do not consume strong drinks, which would be considered alcoholic beverages. Um, they do not consume hot drinks, which would be like tea or coffee or really anything hot, even hot chocolate. Um, 
is questionable. They, most of them are vegetarians. They eat meat sparingly. They focus on grains and they keep enough food and clothing for a year. So they're some of our original preppers and they fast one day a month and donate their food to the poor. Most of them also do not drink caffeine. So you saw tea and coffee, but other forms of caffeine as well, such as soda. Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists uh, are led by Mrs. White, who actually wrote many quote-unquote nutrition books herself, and they believed in a second coming of Christ. There are one million in the U.S. and 18 million worldwide. They do observe the Sabbath. Um, American breakfast cereal industry is the result of the dietary and health practices of Seventh-day Adventists. And Dr. John Kellogg, if you can remember, Kellogg cereal was actually a Seventh-day Adventist who invented cereal, cornflakes. Um, interestingly, seven Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists live longer than any population in the United States. And in Loma Linda, California, there are more centarians or, or people living to over 100 than any other place in the United States. And these centarians are Seventh-day Adventists. And it has to do with their lifestyle. Most of them are vegetarian. Um, they don't drink, et cetera, as well as their close family ties. So moderation is practiced, vegetarianism is encouraged, they don't eat pork or shellfish if they do eat any meat and overeating is encouraged, or sorry, discouraged. I used to work at a Seventh-day Adventist hospital in the Central Valley of California, and while they did serve meat there, um, the bacon that they served would be turkey bacon. <laughs> And so a lot of the people would complain if they knew what it was, but if they didn't know what it was, they would eat it and have no idea and think it was good. Additional guidelines. So they encourage beans, nuts, vegetable oils, and whole grains. They were primarily vegetarian because they said that in the Garden of Eden, there were no meats. Um, some of them do consume milk and eggs, however. Water is the most important liquid, but it should only be consumed before and after a meal, not during a meal, and spices are avoided, so foods are generally pretty bland. Snacking and eating between meals is also discouraged, and according to the prophet, prophecies of Mrs. White, you should uh, take five to six hours between eating meals. This is a video about Seventh-day Adventists that I do have a link to on Canvas, and the video has subtitles in all languages, which I, I don't necessarily like, um, but it's meant to be kind of mass marketed to anybody who might be following the Seventh-day Adventist church. But it does go into a lot of diet and lifestyle factors that contribute to the Seventh-day Adventist health. And so it is a pretty interesting watch if you want to learn more about them. Islam. So Islam is not only a religion, but a way of life. And Islam literally means submission, and specifically its submission to the will of God. It is the second largest religious group in the world and actually growing. And people who follow Islam are called Muslims. There are no priests. Each Muslim can communicate with God directly. They have... Um, their writings are found in the Quran or Quran, and so this is not the same as the Jewish book, um, but it does sound very much the same. There are five pillars of Islam, faith, prayer, almsgiving. Almsgiving is an offering to the poor, and so people will save two and a half percent of their income and donate it to the poor every year. Fasting is part of the pillars of Islam, and so it fulfills the obligation to Allah and signifies hunger of the poor, and then a pil pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, Mecca is the holy land in Islamic religion, and no non-Muslim can enter Islam. Halal is the name given to Islamic dietary laws. And so eating is only done for sustenance and survival and health. Eating is not done for pleasure or indulgence. And people are encouraged to only eat until they're two-thirds full. 
Um, let's see, food is not to be wasted. Sometimes utensils are not used and they may eat with the right hand. You never eat with the left hand because it's considered unclean. And foods that are considered unlawful um, under halal are considered haram. So haram would be unlawful foods. What types of foods would be forbidden under Islamic dietary law? So swine or pigs, four-footed animals that catch their prey, so carnivores, birds of prey, um, with talons and any byproducts of these animals, any improperly slaughtered animals, blood and blood products, alcoholic beverages, and drugs. There are some exceptions to haram, um, which foods are not allowed. And uh, for example, a Muslim may eat or drink foods if they're taken by mistake, so if they didn't know, or when they've been forced by others to eat them, or if they're truly starving and they have to eat foods to prevent hunger or disease or starvation or disease. And then there's some foods that are considered mashbo, and these are foods that are questionable, that uh, the halal rules don't specify strict recommendations about. I think I forgot to talk about Ramadan. Um, so Ramadan is one of the fast days, but Ramadan is not just a fast day. It's the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. And so people will fast during the daytime hours for the entire month. And I actually happen to be in Morocco, which is mostly Islamic country during Ramadan. And um, it, was, it wasn't the best experience as a tourist because all of the restaurants were closed and you could not get food after um, sunrise or before sunset. All right, Hinduism. So Hinduism is one of the old, world's oldest religions. And um, most people who follow Hinduism live in India. This is the basis for many other religions such as Buddhism. Hindus believe in rebirth and karma. And they're very tolerant of other gods. And many different religions have been absorbed into Hinduism. This is a short video about Hinduism um, spoken by somebody who's practicing Hinduism herself. It is, it is actually, I just said short, but it's about 17 minutes long. However, it is quite interesting if you're interested to learn more about Hinduism. Hinduism practiced the caste systems. This has actually been outlawed. However, it is still prevalent, even though it's illegal. And the castes are um, rankings of people by their spiritual progress and culture, not necessarily their wealth or power. So there are different castes. There are the Brahmins, who are the teachers and priests, the Kasatras, who are the soldiers, the Vaisas, who are merchants and farmers, the Sundras, who are laborers, and then the untouchables. And the untouchables do not fit into a social caste. And there are many rules regarding food and which caste can eat with which other caste and who can prepare food for whom. Hindu dietary practices. So they avoid foods that could hinder their mental abilities. They follow the laws of Manu. And so um, they, they say no sin is attached to eating flesh or drinking wine or gratifying the sexual urge, for these are natural propensities of men, but abstinence from these bears greater fruits. So they're saying kind of gratifying yourself with food is not simple, but if you restrain from that, that would be better. Most Hindus are vegetarians or partial vegetarians, and this is because they do not believe in inflicting pain on animals or eating meat. They have some interesting um, rules regarding who can prepare food. And I, I'm not going to ask you who, but I think it's just kind of interesting, so I'll read it to you. Um, so food should be avoided from the following people. Doctors, artists, carpenters, cobblers, innkeepers, prostitutes, liars, spies, thieves, and musicians. Um, so that is quite interesting to me. And then this is also interesting to me. Foods that have been contaminated by sneezing, I think most people would like to avoid that, that have come in contact with a human foot, I think we'd like to avoid that. Milk from animals that have recently given birth and water from the bottom of the boat should be avoided. I would agree with most of those things. 
Additional dietary practices, most Hindus do not drink. Um, they do not eat spicy things or foods such as garlic, turnips, onions, and leeks. They believe that certain foods are pure and certain foods are polluted. And so many of the food laws are based on that concept. Um, body products are considered to be polluted and water is considered to be pure. And so they often wash themselves and pray in the Ganges River because this is supposed to be one of the most pure sources. They do often practice feasts, and when they feast, they say the feast days are when the poor gets to eat because they will be donating food to the poor um, so that they can share in the meals. Segue. So we're kind of done with religious foods, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, meat prohibitions. So many cultures impose restrictions on what meats can be consumed and what meats do we generally not eat in the U.S.? Well, for one, I would say we generally do not eat squirrel. I, I don't think this is common in any of the grocery stores I've ever been to. Um, other foods that we don't eat, maybe we don't eat horse, maybe we don't eat dogs, we don't eat guinea pigs, we don't eat cats, we don't eat llama, we don't eat alpaca for the most part. Um, but these are meats that are eaten in other countries. We don't eat insects. We don't eat a lot of worms, although insects and worms are growing in popularity as well as the products from them. How have meat prohibitions come about? They think that meat prohibitions came about if either an animal was more valuable alive or it didn't fit into the ecology of a community. Um, and so an animal that may be more valuable alive would be a horse. And so that's why they wouldn't eat it. An animal that doesn't really fit into the ecology or economy of a community might be a pig. Um, pigs also are known to carry a disease called trichinosis. Pigs also will eat anything. So they actually compete with humans for foods. And many pigs are considered unclean. In India, they prohibit the eating of beef, even though that is something that we commonly eat in the United States, and cattle are considered sacred. They use all parts of the cow, um, except for actually eating the cow, but they use the dung as fuel and also to build houses. I've seen Indian women gathering um, patties of cow dung, dried cow dung on their heads, and literally taking them back to their villages to use as fuel and as the walls of their houses, and they use cow milk um, and also for farming. Buddhism. So Buddhism was founded by Siddhartha Gautama, and he was later known as Buddha or the Enlightened One. And Buddhism believes that all beings go through the cycle of death, rebirth, karma, liberation, and the path to wisdom that includes taming the appetite and passion of the body. There are many teachings found in Buddhism, um, and many people who are Buddhist in the United States have immigrated from Japan, China, and East Asia. Buddhist dietary practices, most are lacto-ovo-vegetarians, meaning they don't eat meat, but maybe they will have milk products and um, eggs. And Buddhist monks are in retreat and meditation where they are generally undergoing daily fasts, even longer fasts. At the end of this meditation period, the fast is broken and people from the community will bring monks food to eat. So I believe that this is the conclusion of this lecture. I hope you learned a little bit about diet and religion. Um, this was no means an all extensive look into this topic. You could take a whole class on this. Um, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.